On a recent live stream, Christian apologists Al Fadi and Sam Shamoun did a video on the Trinity in the Targum Neophyti. I'll be reading from Sam Shamoun's answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I'll put a link in the description of this video. I do not take credit for this discovery, but I wanted to share it with you guys because I don't know if all of you are watching Sam Shamoun or if you have not watched this entire live stream and want a concise version of what has been discovered. So the Targum Neophyti is a Jewish paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible, that is the, our Christian Old Testament, also known in Hebrew as the Torah and the Tanakh. And this ancient version furnishes evidence that there were specific non-Christian, so these are practicing Jews who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah or believing that he was the Son of God, they clearly saw from their reading of Genesis a plurality of divine persons. So the Targum Neophyti is a version of the Hebrew Bible translated into Aramaic. It is a paraphrase, as Sam Shamoon says, but you can also say it's a commentary. So they're adding more meaning that they have discovered throughout all their theological studies. They're adding more meaning into phrases in the Hebrew Bible. So essentially, when the average layperson reads the Old Testament in English, they're probably getting like 10, 20% of the full meaning. When somebody reads it in the original Hebrew, they're getting the majority of the full meaning. But that's not even enough because you have to be educated in manners of theology in order to understand the writing style, the symbolism, metaphor that's used in the Bible in many different scenarios by many different authors. Genesis was written by the prophet Moses. He has a certain way of writing things symbolically and fantastically and a certain way of writing things differently when it comes to the law, which he is so precise about you'd think it came from a recording of a courtroom. So Moses writes in different styles, as do all the authors in the Old Testament, and that is something that you have to understand, and there are many different contexts that you need to be aware of when studying theology. So somebody who just goes to the store, buys a Bible, flips open Genesis 1-1, and reads it in English, you're probably getting about 20 to 30 percent of the true meaning, because you're missing the original language with the original context, and you're also missing the theological understanding of these subjects that you need to have prior to going into this extremely ancient holy document. So we're going to read from the Targum Neophytes version of Genesis 1, 1. Here it is. On, again, this is on Sam Shamoun's blog. I will be posting the description. From the beginning with wisdom, the Son of the Lord created the heavens and the earth. So that is on the Targum Neophyte. So right here, Sam continues by saying, A non-Christian Jewish source affirms that God has a son by whom he created the heavens and the earth. To say that this is remarkable would be a wild understatement. Okay, so why is this so remarkable? Let's discuss. Sam is describing that these are non-Christian, as I said before, non-Christian Jews who were living in, I believe it was North Africa that this was discovered. They did not succumb to Christian theology, and they did not see themselves as Christians. They kept the Sabbath, and they read their Hebrew Bible in its original languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, and translated a version of the Hebrew Bible, sorry, they translated the Hebrew Bible into a newer Aramaic version. By them having this here, supported the idea, as seen in Peter Schaeffer's book, I believe it's called Two Gods in Heaven, it may also be called Two Powers in Heaven. Those are two different books on similar subjects. And it also agrees with my previous video on Jewish professor Benjamin D. Sommer that there was a multiplicity of personhoods of God, so more than one divine power in heaven, but not multiple pagan gods. And that that was an element found in Judaism. And Benjamin D. Sommer and I both agreed that you can no longer say the Trinity is 100% uh, influenced from Greek, Greco-Roman paganism. Rather, it is found in strands of Judaism. Not every Jew in all of history believed it, but some Jews did in certain denominations. And to say that it is part of Judaism would be correct. Does that mean that all Jews today need to immediately go and follow these teachings? That's up for them to decide, but it does appear in Judaism, so it can be a valid point. And here is more evidence in this Targum Neophyti that we have non-Christian Jews who are seeing the multi-personhood of God without having to reference the words Trinity or, or Christ or the Messiah or Jesus at all. Without saying the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're still talking about a son or different manifestation of the Lord. We'll continue. The word memora, logos, is probably missing in the text, as a hand has erased the wa of shaka. These are different Semitic letters. 
and therefore one should translate from the beginning the word of the Lord with wisdom created and perfected the heavens of the earth. In Jewish Christian dialogue, Bereshit was often translated as in the sun. The problem with, foregoing, with the foregoing assertion, Shimon continues, is that the Aramaic has the phrase bara di Jehovah, which literally reads the son of Jehovah. Therefore, no amount of conjecture can erase this fact. He'll go on to prove more verses from our normal Hebrew Bible talking about Trinitarianism. I don't even like to use the word Trinitarianism that much anymore because the second you open your mouth and say Trinitarianism, people start speaking about Romans and Europeans and Greco-Roman paganism. Of course, I have no problem with modern Greeks and modern descendants of Romans at all who are in fact Christians. But people have some kind of aversion to the word Trinity, which, to be fair, does not appear in the Bible. So I like to call the Trinity, which I have no problem saying, but more accurately, you can say it is the multi-personhood of God, or the multiplicity of divine powers in heaven. And that was seen in Judaism. So you can't say the Trinity by itself, as we understand it today, was in Judaism perfectly coherent to church teaching. It wasn't. So that's why I, even though Sam Shamoon says Trinity, that's fine, it makes sense for the argument. For me, I say the multi-personhood of God was found in Judaism, because that is the truth, but they didn't know it was called the Trinity, they didn't call it the Trinity, and they didn't have as deep as an understanding as found in the New Testament, in the Gospels and the Epistles. So Sam continues to talk about instances of the multi-personhood of God, of Trinitarianism, in the Old Testament. Here we read from Proverbs 33-4, I have not learned wisdom nor the knowledge of the holy ones, Kedoshim, do I know, who has gone up to the heavens and come down, who has scooped up the wind in his palms, who wrapped up the waters in a cloak, who raised up all the ends of the earth, what is his name or the name of his son that you should know? So, because obviously we have a lot of different instances of plurality in, um, in our normal Hebrew Bible, but we're going to talk more about the Targum, which is the purpose of the video. The Targum has a lot more to say. Sam Shemun says. We're going to quote from the Targum right now. This is Genesis 1, verses 2 to 3, and then 26 to 29. And the earth was empty and without form, and desolate without a son of man or beast, and void of all cultivation of plants and of trees. And darkness was spread over the face of the abyss, and a spirit of love from before the Lord was blowing over the face of the water. And the word of the Lord said, Let there be light, and there was light according to the decree of his word. And the Lord said, let us create man in our image, similar to ourselves, and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And the word of the Lord created the Son of Man in his own image, in a resemblance from before the Lord he created him, male and his partner he created them. And the glory of the Lord blessed them, and the word of the Lord said to them, Be strong, and multiply, and fill all the earth, and subdue it have dominion over the fishes of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. And the glory of the Lord said, Behold, I have given you all the herbs that produce seed, that are on the face of all the earth, and every tree that has fruit on it, the fruit-bearing tree, to you I have given them as food. So, let's analyze some of the things that are found in bold here. And a spirit of love from before the Lord was blowing over the face of the water. So, a spirit of love. I did not say the Lord was blowing over the face of the water. It says, a spirit of love from before the Lord. So we can see that this is yet another example, if however minor, of a distinction between God, his spirit, and his word. It continues saying, and the word of the Lord said this, and the Lord, word of the Lord said that, decree of his word, similar to ourselves. And later, and the word of the Lord created the Son of Man as his own man. What I find most interesting is that it says, And the glory of the Lord blessed them, and the word of the Lord said to them. So this is a great example right here. And the glory of the Lord blessed them, and the word of the Lord said to them. Because if we were just talking about one personhood, you could say, it would just say, And the glory of the Lord blessed them, and said to them, Be strong and multiply. But here it specifically states we have the glory of the Lord is blessing them. And the word of the Lord is saying to them. So the word of the Lord is not blessing them. The word of the Lord is not blessing them and saying. And the glory of the Lord is not blessing them and saying. The glory is blessing. And the word is saying. The word is the one saying. Just how earlier it says, and the word of the Lord said, let there be light. 
Now, of course, we have the usual arguments of similar to ourselves. Let us make them in our image. I will tackle that in a different video. I think it's been discussed enough, but I'll discuss it anyway in a different video. This is the most interesting part. The glory of the Lord blessed and the word of the Lord said. That is exactly what the multi-personhood of God is. That is the textbook definition of what we consider the multi-personhood of God. You have one element that is God, that is blessing them, and you have another element that is God, that is saying to them, and the text itself differentiates between glory of God and word of God. Glory of God does one thing, word of God does another thing. Both of them are a part of God, belong to God, and what a Christian would say, comprise the Godhead. So Christians say Jesus, the Father, you know, the divine Son, Jesus, the Father Almighty, and the Holy Spirit comprise the Trinity, or comprise the triune God, or comprise the Godhead. And here, the glory of the Lord, and the word of the Lord, and of course, just the Lord himself, as we see, spirit of love from before the Lord. So we have the Lord himself, just the Lord, is being referenced. And later, we have the glory of the Lord blessing them, and then we have the word of the Lord saying to them. And of course, we have three here. We have the Lord, the glory of the Lord, and we have the word of the Lord. Now again, these Jews probably did not understand the Trinity and the depth and exact uh, precise sayings that a modern Christian does, or the church did at the time. But they were clearly differentiating between the glory belonging to God, the word belonging to God, both of them being God, having the authority of God, and comprising what we would call the Godhead. They don't say the Godhead here, and that's fine, because the idea is right there in the Targum Neophyti. So I wanted to share that with you guys, because... This is incredibly fascinating, and I think a lot is changing in the arena of theology, and especially with Christianity, a lot is changing in that the old assumption, even from just five or ten years ago, that the Trinity, also known as the multi-personhood of God, or the multiplicity of divine powers in heaven, is some kind of strange Greco-Roman idea that was just forced into Christianity, and that you know, the Hebrew Bible had absolutely none of that whatsoever, not even not even a reference or a metaphor that could be interpreted like that. This pure, perfect, singular monotheism, and the Greco-Romans completely just ruined it. And that idea is gone. That's down the drain. We can say the Greco-Roman pagans maybe had an easier time understanding a multi-personhood of God rather than just saying the single personhood of God. You could make that argument, but... Just because they understand that, just because it worked for them, doesn't mean that they are the ones who influenced it. Because ancient texts written by non-Christian Jews associate multi-personhood with God. And ancient verses written in the original Hebrew Bible reference plurality of God, a reference to the plurality of his powers, and ancient Judaic sects living in the Holy Land, according to the book Two Gods in Heaven, by Peter Schaeffer, or maybe it's two powers in heaven, of heaven, I'll look that up for you, saw beings like the angel of the Lord as a divine power of God, who is God but distinguished from God, and worthy of worship in Temple of Judaism. So this is why we need to discuss these things, because the ideas are changing. The discoveries are becoming more clear. People assume these are old books from thousands of years ago. You'll never understand anything new. It's just set in stone. That's not true. We're discovering things every single day. Thank you for listening, guys.